the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present The Pacific Story. In the mounting fury of world conflict, events in the Pacific are taking on ever greater importance. Here is the story of the Pacific and the millions of people who live around this greatest sea. The drama of the peoples whose destiny is at stake in the Pacific War. Here, as another public service, is the tale of the war in the Pacific and its meaning to us and to the generations to come. The Andaman Islands. You'd better come along. No. My home here. I stay. But that wound of yours needs attention. Wound, all right. You go, Mr. Twyman. The Japanese are likely to be here any time. We cannot hold out against them now, but we shall be back. Then you can come back here with us. Me. Wait. Akabir. We've known each other nearly 30 years. Whatever I know about these islands, you have taught me. Now, I want you to trust me. The Japanese will soon be here. They have bombed us twice. We haven't the strength to resist the Japanese. All right, Mr. Twining, the boat's ready. We're waiting for you, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, Akabir, come along with me. Me, stay. Goodbye, Mr. Twining. I won't say goodbye, Akabir. I shall be back. Right over this way, Mr. Twining. Yes, sir. Come on. My last impression of the Andamans was Akabir standing there on the waterfront of Port Blair. It was only a matter of weeks after that until the Japanese took the island. They immediately started using the airfield. They brought in heavy naval craft, battleships, aircraft carriers, cruisers, and based them at Port Blair and in many of the other harbors up and down the length of the islands. They made the Andamans a strategic stronghold. For, you see, the Andamans are almost the same distance from Singapore, Rangoon, Ceylon, and Calcutta. And that makes them important. For nearly three years now, from here in Calcutta... We've kept our eyes on the Japanese and the Andamans. I wonder what has happened to Akabir. He was the first Andamanese I saw when I landed in the islands before World War I. Me carry your bags, mister? Oh, yes, thank you. I'm going to the office of the governor. Me take you there. I watched him as he walked ahead of me with my two bags. Scarcely five feet tall, powerfully built and black as ebony. He took me to government house there on Ross Island in Blair Harbor... He waited outside while I went in to report my arrival. Glad to have you here with us, Twining. You'll find these Andaman Islands extraordinary. Yes, sir. This is jungle country, of course. So there are some dangers. Yes, sir. There are no dangerous wild animals on the islands, but there are some poisonous snakes, cobras, blue karites, and some vipers. And the people, uh, some of them, are friendly, like that fellow who carried up your bags. But many of them are dangerous, like the Dirawa tribe. But you'll learn to get along. Oh, I hope so, sir. We have the penal settlement here, as you know. And although we have many murders among the convicts, so everything is fairly well organized and pretty much reduced to routine. So, uh, welcome to the Andamans, Twining, and the best to you. All these things were impressions, glimpses of the things I was to learn. I thought about them as I left Government House. When I got outside, Akabir was still there waiting for me. Me take you to house. Yes, thank you. This way. He picked up my bags and he led me down to the bungalow in which I was to live. It was built of teak with a wide veranda and a red roof. Like the pictures I'd seen of houses in Burma. This, your house. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, here, uh, this is for you. No. He stood there, shaking his head and smiling. Then he turned and pointed to a building some little distance. That is clubhouse. For you. Oh, oh, the clubhouse. Good. That is church. A church, too. <laughs> I could see that he was enjoying pointing out the places of importance. 
And to encourage him, I pointed to an imposing building on the mainland and asked, uh, What's that? That is jail. His face was grim as he said it. And before I could say anything further, he had turned and walked away. <laughs> I had a lot to learn about these people and their islands. These islands, with their many ragged inlets and harbors, had been visited by explorers for hundreds of years. Marco Polo had talked about them and had written about the people that were no better than wild beasts. Italian navigators had visited them. And in 1789, the British came. I worked with in Government House knew the whole story of the Andamans. It was Captain Blair who came here first. That was back in 1789. Came here, right here to Port Blair, and set up a penal settlement. Only he called it Port Cornwallis. Yes. But three years later, they moved the whole blooming business up to North Andaman, and they called the new site Port Cornwallis. Had two Port Cornwallises, did they? No. After they moved the penal settlement north, they call this Old Harbor. Then when did they start calling this Port Clare? Uh, that was, uh, well, along about the middle 1800s. Yes, yes. A doctor named Mowat came out here, head of a sort of commission of some kind. Came out to select a site for a new penal settlement, and he chose Old Harbor here, which he then named Port Blair. All this deepened my understanding of Port Blair and the Andamans. These islands had been selected for a penal settlement because they were so isolated, so primitive. The convicts were brought from India, Burma, and Malaya, and many of them were from the islands themselves. There were convicts around everywhere. Yet, as time passed, I could see that the Andamans were more than a godforsaken group of islands. I could see that with the passing years, they were becoming more and more important strategically. The weather observatory at Port Blair, for example, was important, and was to be still more important later. It's only really hot like this when the sun is nodding. Doesn't it ever cool off? The heat is tempered by the sea breezes. Haven't you noticed? Seems to me it's always warm. When does it rain? Well, the rain is irregular, but the rainy season's from May to November. I could do with some rain, and some of those sea breezes, too. It's the sea breezes that are dangerous. That is, when they get bad. The path of the hurricanes is just a few miles offshore. Don't they ever hit here? It's the shipping they destroy mostly. Back in 1844, two British troop ships, the Runnymede and the Briton, were caught in a hurricane out there one black night, and both of them were thrown up over the reef and into the jungles. And funny thing, neither of the crews knew the other ship was thrown into the jungle until daylight the next day. Yes, the hurricanes out there can get very severe. It seemed that everything, every place in the islands had some story about it. People would say, this is where so-and-so happened. And because I was new in the islands, they never missed a chance to pass it on to me. It was right here in the year 1872. Lord Mayo, the Viceroy of India, had just visited Mount Harriet here on the north shore of Ross Island and was returning to his lodge. Jim, there will be some problems. Mount Harriet might be a suitable place for the sanatorium. Yes, sir. The launch is waiting right over here, Lord Mayo. Uh, Seven bells. Time to get back to the ship. I say, it's very dark. It seems as though the jungle comes right down to the water. It's so dark. If it weren't for those torch bears you've got ahead there, we shouldn't be able to see a thing. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, boat crew's all ready to take us out to the ship. Uh, very good. Look out! Look out! There. Look out for that man! He's got a knife! Look out, Lord Mayo! Look out for that knife! <laughs> grab that man there! Oh, grab him! Lord Mayor, Lord Mayor. 
I'm all, I'm all right. I'm, I'm not much hurt. Look at his blood. They gashed him in the back. Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor. He's dead. The black one, the one that did it, he... He'll never try this with anyone else. Never. Who was it? One of the ticket of leave convicts. When first I learned that Akabir was an ex-convict, a self-supporter, I was very uncertain about him. He was friendly, but I was uneasy. Everyone in Port Blair knew him. Before he was 20, he'd killed his rival for killing the Andamanese woman they both loved. And for this, he'd been sent to prison. He never talked of it. And neither did I. At first, I was afraid ever to be alone with him. And gradually, I grew to trust him, and we often took jaunts together. This is Padak. Very good tree. <laughs> what is it called, the Akubia? Padak. Sometimes called Redwood. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Padak, of course. Uh, that's Andaman Redwood. Yes. Redwood. Very good. Well, I've heard about it. Very valuable, isn't it? Yes. Many trees cut down. Send away. Yes. I know it's exported, Akubia. There's certainly a lot of it out here. Listen. You listen? What? Akabir? Hear that? That sound. Sounds like the wind and trees. That Puluga. Oh, yes. Puluga. Puluga make all trees. All birds. All water. Sky. Make you. Make me. Of course. The creator. Yes. From Akabir I learned about the spirit of the woods and the spirit of the sea and the devils of which one must beware. He led me into the mountains, the highest of which I think was about 2,400 feet. And he led me down through the dry beds of the streams. He showed me where coconuts and rubber were cultivated and where rice and maize, tea and hemp are grown. And he guided me up to Phoenix Bay to the shipyard. He stood by silently. And I talked to one of the foremen. We build most of the sea craft you see around these islands. Oh, you, you seem to have an excellent shop here. It's not as big as the ones on the Clyde. <laughs> but we can build anything up to a vessel of 250 to 400 tons. You see... There's one on the ways right over there. Ah, smart craft it is, too. Aye, the best. You see, we have here our own blacksmith shop. And we build our craft mostly from the timbers out of the forest. Back of us there. Oh, to turn out uh, vessels of this kind, these workers of yours must be skilled indeed. They are. We've made carpenters and wood carvers out of them. And some of them can even handle the lathes and power saws. Well, if you'll excuse me, New... I'll be getting back to my work. Sure thing. Uh, goodbye. Thank you. When I looked around, uh, Akabir was still standing there, silently watching the workers. Akabir, would you like to work here in the shipyard? No. Wouldn't you like to help build these boats? No. Make what need. That is all. I found that that was characteristic of nearly all the natives of the Andamans. There's valuable timber of many kinds around them, not only paduk, but banyan and marble wood, satin wood and iron wood, which is so tough that it is impervious to almost the sharpest axe. Yet they use almost none of it. As Akabir said, they make what they themselves need. Utensils, implements, some weapons, and some personal ornaments. You've got a lot to learn about these people, Twining. I heard that again and again. These Abedonese learn up to a certain point. Then they cannot seem to learn beyond that. For example, they're probably the only people in the world who don't know how to make a fire. Well, they use fire. I've seen them. Of course. They keep them going day and night. They say fire is a gift from the gods, so they can't let it go out. They're nomads. What 
can they do when they travel? They carry their fires with them. Another thing, you can hardly influence them one way or another. If they like you, very good. If they don't, you can scarcely do anything that will make them like you. They simply don't respond to it. I wondered about that when I was out in a boat alone with Ackerby or Turtle hunting. He seemed friendly, yet he killed a man. And he had a sharp harpoon. And a bow and arrows powerful enough to shoot through me. Here, you shoot bow and arrow. He handed me the bow and an arrow. I tried to figure out what he had in mind. I watched him. As I put the arrow in the bow, and I set myself to draw it. Pull. Pull arrow back. I, 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 I can't draw it. I tried to draw it. It was too powerful. Oh. Give to me. Although I was nearly a foot taller than he, I couldn't budge it. He drew it back almost without effort and shot the arrow so far I lost sight of it. And then, looking at me, he put down the bow and picked up the sharp harpoon. You know me once prisoner? Yes, Akabir. I believe I heard something about that. I wonder what he was getting at. He was holding the harpoon in his hands, looking at me. First six months, me locked up in big jail. But Yes, I can well imagine that, Akabir. Next year on hop, hard work with other prisoners. I'd heard about that 18-month period when the convicts were under severe discipline of hard labor. Next three years, me work outside settlement. Sleep in barracks. Work outside. Well, that was better, wasn't it? A uh, little better. Next five years, me boss, other prisoner. Then me get ticket of leave. That meant that for all practical purposes, he was free. I was to learn that this was the usual ten-year routine for the convicts who could be trusted at all. Those who showed themselves unfitted to human society were kept under closer supervision. Now, me, self-supporter, me earn own living. With this, he held up the sharp harpoon. I kept paddling the native boat. He stood in the bow. And suddenly he turned for me and looked straight ahead in the direction in which we were moving. Tortoise! Tortoise! Directly ahead of us on the surface was a huge hawk-billed turtle. Hi there, the With a mighty effort, he lunged with the harpoon and flung himself from the boat. With his full weight behind it, the harpoon buried itself into the turtle. The next instant, both Ackerbeard and the huge horse-filled turtle were floundering about in the water. Me get him! Me get him! <laughs> and he laughed for joy as he pulled the struggling, dying turtle back to the boat. Akabir's principal means of livelihood was harpooning turtles. He was an expert at hunting both the hawksbill and the green turtle. The green turtle was used for food, and the tortoise shell of the hawksbill was exported to Calcutta. In occupations such as this, many of the ticket of leave prisoners supported themselves. But some, the incorrigible ones, declined to make any effort to support themselves. They thought only of escape. Ahead of us, you think they are, Akabir? Not far now. Making camp for night now. Then we'd better keep going till we overtake them, Hawkins. I think they escaped. We've been trailing the two Jarawa tribesmen for three days. After they'd escaped from the penal settlement, they'd killed a shipyard worker at Phoenix and then had gone into the jungle. You lead the way, Akabir. Keep us on their trail. Yes. Pygmies in the jungle are so clever that you can go for days without seeing one of them. I can't see how a human being of any kind could live in these jungles. They can't. Most of the convicts who escape into the jungles are killed by the poison arrows of the pygmies. This way. Getting close now. Watch yourself well now, Twining. Yes, sir. There. Ahead. Campfire. By George. That's it. Easy now. Creep up on them. Both of them are there. See them in the light of that campfire? Yes. Yes, I see them. Akabir, you come with me. 
We'll go around this way. And Bolton, you and Twining go around the other way. When you see me rushing, you two rush them from the other side. Right, oh, Hawking. We crept around on their left flank and then moved in toward them. We could see them plainly in the flickering light of their campfire. Powerful little black men with sooty hair growing in wings. Look, Twining. They're well armed. See those knives and those bows and arrows? As I looked at them, suddenly, just opposite us, Hawkins and Ackerbeer came charging out of the jungle straight for the tribesmen. Close in on them, Bolton! Come on, Twining. Let's go in and get them. Yes, sir. <laughs> One of the tribesmen ran almost directly into our arms. Run, Twining! Run! I got him! Here! Here, I help you! Just at that instant, I saw Hawkins at the campfire. He paused a moment there. The other tribesmen had run off to the side, stopped suddenly, and whirled around with a poison arrow in his bow. He let it fly, it crashed through Hawkins' chest, and he dropped in his tracks. He was dead within the hour. We got the other tribesmen back to jail at last, but he gave the three of us enough trouble to interest me greatly in all the Andamanese. Scientists came to the islands and studied them for years. You see, Twining, this Andamanese has been isolated here since, well, perhaps the Stone Age. Well, that probably accounts for the fact that they are all so much alike. Yes. There is perhaps no purer race on Earth. There are 12 different tribes in the islands here. And while each of these has its own habits, in the broad sense, all of them are about the same, physically and mentally. You see, people are changed by coming in contact with other peoples. But with Andamanese, since the Stone Age, they have come in contact with very few people. And therefore, their strain is almost pure. They are the same today as they were perhaps millions of years ago. Yes, they are the most primitive of all humans. I used to think of this as I watched Akabir. He used to sing strange songs accompanying himself by beating with his foot on a very crude sounding board. This came as close to a musical instrument as anything I ever saw amongst the Andamanese. And watching Akabir, it seemed to me he was a Stone Age man who by some magic was living in the modern world of today. After those first years, 30 years ago, Akabir used to go with me everywhere. We came to understand each other. He was very much interested in the lands of the white men and the kinds of lives they lived. He went with me on my trips from one end of the Andamans to the other. We visited Port Campbell and Port Murt, and Kwantung Harbor and Port Andaman. And by the time the Japanese were on the move in the Pacific, he realized the danger that we faced. Gentlemen, I've called you together to tell you of the seriousness of our situation here in the Andamans. As you know, the Royal Navy suffered a heavy blow to the loss of our battle cruisers, Prince of Wales, and Repulse, two days after Pearl Harbor. Today, I have to report a still more unhappy matter. Singapore has fallen. Singapore? 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 I can't believe it. Heavy units of the Japanese fleet are moving into the harbor of Singapore this very moment. We are only a thousand miles from Singapore. Our strategic location would be of great value to the Japanese. We command the western approaches to the Strait of Malacca, and we are within striking distance of Rangoon, Calcutta, and Ceylon. We may expect the Japanese here any time. Akabir understood the meaning of this. He knew that we were unable to hold the Andamans against the Japanese. They will come here with guns? Quite possibly, Akabir. Akabir, fight. We all worked feverishly for the Japanese attack which we knew would come. Akabir helped us at the airport, loading planes with the things that must be saved. The anti-aircraft batteries opened up. The bombers came straight over the field. They dropped fire on us, Mr. Twining. Yes, if they can, Akabir. They'll try to destroy the airfield. The 
they blasted the airstrips of bombs and then wheeled around and came back. They're coming back. They're going to scrape us. Look out. Look out for the machine gun. Look out. Look out. Down, Akabir, get down. I uh, oh. Uh, let me see, Akabir. Let me see where they got you. Uh, here. In back. In back. Akabir never complained. He lay there, trying to understand what had happened and why. Five days later, the Japanese came back. It was plain now that the Japanese would soon come in with a landing force. We are unable to defend the long indented coast of the Andamans. We will put out of commission everything that can be of use to the enemy. The naval dockyards, the airstrips, the weather, weather observatory, and then we shall evacuate the island. The Japanese took Port Blair on March the 23rd, 1942. Intelligence reports came into Calcutta of what was happening. The Japanese already operating from the airfield at Port Blair. A full Japanese battle fleet of battleships, aircraft carriers, cruisers, destroyers and escorts is approaching Port Blair and probably will use its harbor. That's the first time in history, Twining, that a Japanese task force has steamed into the Bay of Bengal. All of us knew the gravity of the situation. The great danger of a possible invasion of India, and perhaps even of South Africa. Uh, this report has just come in, sir. Thank you. The heavy cruisers Dorsetshire and Cornwall have been sunk by Japanese torpedo planes and bombers. Good heavens. Here's a message, sir, from Trincomalee, Ceylon. Yes, thank you. The British naval base at Trincomalee on the island of Ceylon is under attack by carrier-based Japanese aircraft. Twining. These attacks are being made from carriers based on Port Blair. The Japanese were already using the Andamans against us with deadly effect. They may try to strike across the Indian Ocean and take Madagascar. Then they would be in a position to invade Africa and cut our supply line to Egypt. The danger to the Allies was great. The Andamans, virtually ignored since the Stone Ages, suddenly sprang into importance. The enemy held them and was converting them into a strategic stronghold. Now they were to be the scene of a struggle for control. And soon, heavy Allied bombers were taking off from India to blast them. Shore installations, the harbor, and the airfields became our target. It's been three years now. And now, as Britain's naval strength is growing in the Bay of Bengal... And as the possibility grows of our return to the Andamans, I can't help but wonder about Akabir. I wonder if he has lived through what's happened in the Andamans. And I think to the last thing that he said to me. Me stay here, Mr. Twining. Goodbye. through the Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations as a public service to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross-currents of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. To repeat, for a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. The Pacific Story is written and directed by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. The principal voice was that of Ramsey Hill. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.